Well, hello again everybody. Now for those of you that are tuning in to the first time to see what we're doing on the bench, we have this little CNC machine and uh, it comes with a motor here which is only good for about 10,000 RPM. And what I've decided to do is to actually upgrade it to use a, it's, it's another motor which actually is the same physical size but apparently this is good for 20,000 RPM. So in the previous episodes what we actually did was we uh, we connected up a power supply to this motor and we actually measured the speed and yes it does do 20,000 RPM. Now unfortunately we did have some problems with this motor in the form of well not the motor itself but it came with this collet chuck and uh, this collet chuck was actually very very badly out of balance it was uh, it was machined very poorly so again there's another video of me having a go at trying to uh, correct the machining of this and uh, I've got to admit the results weren't perfect but they were certainly better than when I started so here's the motor it draws about two or three times the amount of current that the old motor does and because this motor does draw more current the power supply that this little CNC machine comes with wouldn't be adequate to power this uh, this new motor I'm just seeing what it says in it okay so it actually says that this is actually five amps so that's not too bad is it um, this motor probably doesn't draw much more than five amps but it probably draws a little bit more than that at start up and maybe it will draw more when it's under load so actually looking at this this isn't too bad but I have gone ahead and uh, I bought a bigger power supply here and uh, again last week what, what I did was I printed off a 3DN cap and uh, installed a switch and a fuse and uh, some various plugs and leads so we can connect this up. So we've got our motor, we've got our power supply. What we're going to have a look at today is actually the pulse width modulation or to probably put it a better way, the speed control. I want to be able to control the speed of this motor. I've got to admit the speed of this motor perhaps isn't that important for most jobs. You just want to run it flat out but I don't know, just for my own peace of mind and my own interest if you like, I would like to do some pulse pulse width modulation and be able to control the speed of the motor. So let's just have a look at that first before we uh, go any further. So the screen that you're looking at here is running the software that we use to control our little CNC machine. And you can see over here we've got a spindle control button and what I can do is I can actually just turn the spindle on and off using this soft button here and I can also control the uh, the speed of it. Now the speed control goes between 600 and 1000. Now those speed settings aren't actually calibrated to the real RPM, they're just kind of default values. Now of course the uh, the motor doesn't start at zero because it wouldn't actually start up if you if you wanted the motor to do zero speed. So the way that the software has been set up, the uh, the lowest speed that you can run it at is actually the 600 setting. So effectively the range goes between 600 and 1000 and that's done in these uh, 100 steps. But I think the step size and actually these numbers themselves are pretty arbitrary. So if we go ahead and switch the motor on with this speed setting to 600, it's going to be delivering about half the power to the motor because the motor is going to be switched on about half the time. So let's just try that. So you can hear that that's come on increase the speed a bit, uh, 700, 800, 900 and 1000. Now remember that the speed setting on our software goes between 600 and 1000. So to put that another way, our motor is going to be switched on about six tenths of the time at the moment. So let's switch it on for six tenths of the time. So you can see our square wave here. This is when the square wave is high, that's when the motor is switched on. When the square wave is at the low point, that's when it's switched off. So you can see that our motor is switched on just over uh, just over 50% of the time as I said before maybe that's switched on six tenths of the time so let's increase our motor speed to 700 now and hopefully you can see that our square wave has closed up a little bit the off time has actually reduced and it's now on for more of the time and our motor has responded by speeding up a little bit let's go to 800 now And again, the amount of time the motor's turned off has decreased a little bit more. Let's do 900. 
So you can see now, with our speed setting set to 900, 900 a thousand, or nine tenths, it's actually on most of the time. It's only off for a very short amount of time. So we're now going to turn the motor to full speed and it won't be being turned off at all then, it'll be on 100% of the time. So there we go, our motor is continuously on now, so it's running as fast as it can, it can go flat out. Let's go back to 600 and slow it down. And we'll go backwards and forwards for a lap. So just turning my CNC machine round, you can actually see we've got the control board here. Now we haven't got a circuit diagram for it, but we can take a guess really what it's doing. So this is a free access, uh, a free axis CNC machine. So it has free axes of movements in that it's got an X, a Y, and a Z. So these little boards with the heat sinks pushed onto them, they're actually uh, these are the stepper motor control boards. So it actually takes pulses from the little microprocessor down here and it converts those pulses into a pattern which it uses to uh, to make the stepper motors rotate in whichever direction it wants to. Now these little stepper motor drivers are actually little plug-in modules because, well, they can blow up from time to time and uh, that's why they plug them in because, yeah, they can be blown up. Just looking over here we appear to have some form of large inductor and what I think is a, a little switch mode controller. Uh, this predominantly runs on 24 volts so I'm guessing maybe it drops the 24 volts down to 5 volts. We've got an Atmel microprocessor here. So the little microprocessor that receives serial commands from the PC computer and uh, then it works out the, uh, the kinematics to actually make the stepper motors move the cutting head to wherever it needs to. So there's some clever software going on inside this little Atmel microprocessor. So if I just take some of our wiring and just pull it out the way, hopefully you can see that there's a power transistor here. So that's actually a MOSFET driver. So this is what is delivering the pulses of current to our motor. And uh, I'm not sure what the number is on here. I think it's something like an IR, an IRL, is it IR54? And uh, this is actually a power MOSFET. It's an N-channel enhancement MOSFET. From memory, in the scheme of things, it's actually quite a powerful MOSFET. I think the uh, the current is something like up to about 35 amps. But just going off what other people have said on the internet who've tried to install these bigger motors, if you do install a bigger motor, it does tend to kill this MOSFET. I suspect it's probably not being damaged by the current as such. It's been, uh, It's actually mainly being damaged by the fact that it can't actually dissipate all the... Um, all the heat which is generated during the switching time for the pulse width modulation because you can see that unfortunately there isn't really any heat sinking around this transistor it's got effectively nothing it's just tacked onto the circuit board probably just using the ground plane as a heat sink so this transistor in theory would probably more than be more than capable than switching the motor on and off it's just the way that it's installed in this circuit here it, we can't dissipate the heat in the package and that's probably what kills them so what I'm actually planning to do today is actually to replace this MOSFET with an external MOSFET motor driver and what we can do is hopefully we can heat sink that external MOSFET driver much better and uh, it's not going to get hot and uh, we will be able to control our bigger motor using our bigger power supply. Now when it comes to MOSFETs I've pretty much got no idea what I'm talking about but of course the very little that I do know I'm going to slap out on the bench for you now. Now we don't actually have a circuit diagram of our Gerbil control board but I've taken a guess and I've drawn up what the spindle motor controller probably looks like. And you can see here that we've actually got a microcontroller. So the microcontroller is actually taking commands from the computer that the mini CNC is plugged into. And it's generating the patterns for the stepper motor. And it's also generating the pulse width modulation waveforms, which is being used to control our motor speed. Now the output from our microcontroller, it's being fed into the gate of our MOSFET. 
Now when the gate voltage of the MOSFET is at 5 volts, the actual MOSFET will be turned fully on. And when it's at 0 volts, the MOSFET will be turned off. And you can see from looking at the circuit that one side of our motor is actually permanently connected to the 24 volt supply. So the way that the uh, MOSFET works, it actually pulls one side of the motor down to ground. So one side's permanently connected to 24, and when we want to switch the motor on, we pull the other side of the motor down to 0 volts. So we've got current flowing from the 24 volt rail through the motor into the drain of the MOSFET and out of the source of the MOSFET and into the zero volt rail. So this particular circuit arrangement, they actually call it a low side driver because the switching of the motor, it's not done in the high voltage side, it's not being done in the 24 volt side, it's actually been done on the zero volt side. So it's been done on the low side of the voltage and not the high side of the voltage. So another component that we've got in circuit here is this diode and I'm sure that most of you will know this is called a flyback diode and the purpose of that diode is actually to protect the MOSFET driver from damage. So when we actually switch on the motor, current will flow into those motor windings and that current is turned into a magnetic field. Now when the actual motor is switched off, when we switch off the current to the motor, that magnetic field collapses and it collapses very, very quickly. And what happens is it turns that collapsing magnetic field into a very, very high voltage. So that high voltage would actually do damage to the MOSFET. So the purpose of this diode here, it actually clamps the voltage and it stops it rising to a damaging level. Now, just for interest, let's look at the data sheet for our IRL540 MOSFET. Now just like a bipolar junction transistor, or BJT as we call them, a MOSFET has three terminals. But those terminals have different names than our BJT transistor. Where we would have a collector on a typical NPN transistor, we have what they call a drain. Where we have the emitter, we have something called a source. And where we would have the base of our transistor, we have something called the gate. Now as I'm sure most of you know, BJT transistors, you know, in NPN and PNP flavours, they're controlled by the amount of current flowing into the base of the transistor. But MOSFETs operate quite differently. They have very little current flowing into the gate. What they have is voltage. MOSFET transistors are controlled by gate voltage and they're not controlled by the amount of current flowing into them. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard of Transistor Man. Now, Transistor Man was actually made famous in the Art of Electronics books by Mr. Howitson Hill. Well, here we've got Transistor Man's cousin, and he's called MOSFET Man. Now, one possible way we can conceptualise how a MOSFET works is it's actually a variable resistor which is connected between the drain terminal and the source terminal. And you can see that we can actually vary the resistance. So when the uh, wiper control of our potentiometer, when it's up here, we've actually got no current flowing. But as we actually reduce that resistance, as we actually reduce it getting closer to zero volts here, more and more current will flow from the 24 volt rail through our motor and uh, through this lowering resistance and back into the ground. So the motor will be fully turned on here. And when the wiper's up here, it will be fully turned off. Now the little job that MOSFET man has here, he's got a little voltmeter inside the MOSFET transistor and he's got to look at the voltmeter. The voltmeter is connected to the gate control. So as the gate voltage increases, the voltage will also increase. So it's his job to actually look at the voltage here on the gate, grab this handle here and uh, move it up and down. So at the moment, our gate voltage going into our MOSFET, it's zero. So our little voltmeter here is also at zero. So our little MOSFET man, he's adjusted the control here. He's set it to the maximum resistance, which is going to be in the gig ohms range. So because the resistance between our drain and our source now is so high, there will be no current flow. So our motor's switched off. So you can see that our input voltage in our gate is risen to 5 volts. So transistor man is looking at his little voltmeter and he can see 5 volts on here. So his job is to grab the handle here. He's going to pull that handle down. So as you can see the handle is now all the way at the bottom. This MOSFET transistor is turned on 
as much as it can be. And there's actually a name that they give to this condition when a MOSFET is turned fully on. And on the data sheet, they actually call this condition RDS on. So that's actually measured in ohms, and it's the number of ohms between the drain and the source. And it's actually a very, very low value. It's practically a short circuit. So what the data sheet is telling you here, when the voltage between the gate and the source is equal to 5 volts, the RDS on value of our MOSFET is going to be 0. 0.77 ohms so it's almost a complete short circuit between the drain and the source and uh, this is one of the key characteristics of a MOSFET so when you're using a MOSFET for switching applications like this you really want to get an RDS value as low as possible. While we're taking a look at this data sheet let's look at some of the other important parameters. So you can see here we've got this VDS. Now VDS is the voltage between the drain and the source and it's uh, the units are in volts and it shows here that there is 100 volts. So for our transistor what it's telling us the maximum voltage we can have across the drain and the source is 100 volts. So going back to our circuit, we can see that the maximum voltage here, the supply rail, is 24 volts. So really we can't get more than 24 volts between our drain and source because the supply voltage is 24. But unfortunately that isn't quite true because earlier we did mention that this motor can produce an electric kickback. It has a flyback effect. So the voltage between the terminals of the motor can actually rise quite high. But that's the purpose of this protection diode here. So if we didn't have this protection diode, you know, we could get a, a kickback, a reverse spike of quite a few hundred volts from this motor. So again, when choosing MOSFETs for switching applications, and especially if you're switching inductive loads, which will produce this kickback, you really want to choose quite a high VDS and I would say you know three or four times the supply rail value if not more and of course if it's an inductive load we are going to fit protection diodes freewheeling diodes across our inductor whether that's a coil of a solenoid or a motor. Now we've got another very important parameter here which is the gate and source voltage so this is the maximum voltage that we can put into the gate of our MOSFET. Now before we were saying we're going to feed our MOSFET with microcontroller and we were feeding it with 0 and 5 volts but you can actually see that this MOSFET transistor this has got a maximum gate voltage VGS of 10 volts so for example we could never feed our gate of our MOSFET from our supply rail because our supply rail is 24 volts so if we exceed 10 volts it's very likely that our MOSFET will blow up because this 10 volts here is an absolute maximum and uh, we mustn't exceed that 10 volts. Now previously we said that our MOSFET looks a lot like a resistor but we don't actually use it like a resistor we actually use it much more like a switch. Now for example our MOSFET man here he's either got the motor turned fully off or he grabs hold of the lever and he moves it all the way to the bottom here and uh, he has the motor turned fully on. So when he's got the lever at the bottom here, we've got practically no resistance. It's only being limited by this RDS value. And then when we put the lever to the top here, it's got, well, it's got gig ohms of resistance, certainly many mega ohms anyway. So he never actually puts the, uh, puts the potentiometer wiper. He never puts it in the middle here. He goes from one end right to the other. Well, some of you might be wondering why is that? Because obviously if he actually used it as a variable resistance, he could actually vary the current going to our motor. So let's assume that the full speed motor, the full speed current is 5 amps here. So we've got 5 amps. So to run it at half the speed, let's just pretend that it requires about 2.5 amps. So if you just do a little bit of Ohm's law, 24 volts over 2.5 amps gives us 9.6 ohms. So why doesn't he move this little hand lever here to the 9.6 ohms position? 9.6 ohms, well the current flowing through our motor would now be 2.5 amps and it would, maybe would run about half the speed. Why don't we do that? Why do we use this pulse width modulation where we just go from one extreme to the other? Well let me show you. Well today I'm going to be standing in for our MOSFET man because unfortunately he's had to go to a funeral.
So just like our little diagram earlier, you can see that I've got a voltmeter set up. So this is going to show me the voltage which is on the gate of our MOSFET. Here's our motor. One side of our motor is connected to 24 volts and the other side of our motor is connected to this variable resistance. So what I'm going to do, depending on what the actual gate voltage is here on my meter, I'm going to twist this little knob in our potentiometer. And what we'll be able to do is we're going to be able to vary the current which is flowing to our motor. And we should be able to control the speed, shouldn't we? Well, at the moment, I can see that our gate voltage is actually zero. So that means that this potentiometer, that's going to be turned to its very high resistance setting. And because that's such a high resistance, you know, in the more order of megohms or gigohms, there's actually going to be no current flowing through our motor. So of course our motor's not actually turning. Now I can see all of a sudden somebody's actually put 5 volts onto the gate of our MOSFET so I'd better do my job and pull down the handle and our potentiometer. So because we've got 5 volts on the gate of our MOSFET now, the actual resistance between the drain and the source, this has actually fallen to the RDS value which was about 0.07 ohms. So as much current as possible, the full load current is actually flowing through the motor through this potential divider, which effectively is just a short circuit now. It's like a closed switch. So with five volts on the gate of our MOSFET, the actual resistance between the drain and the source, this has actually dropped down. It's reduced to a very low value. And that low value, of course, is set by the parameter of RDS on. And in the case of the MOSFET that we're modelling, that's going to be about 0.07 ohms. So it, it's a very low resistance value. In fact, you can pretty much say it's working like a switch. The MOSFET's turned fully on. Oh, I can just see the voltage in our gate has suddenly changed again. So this time, actually, it's not 0 volts and it's not 5 volts. They're actually giving us a voltage on the gate of 2.2 volts. So the resistance of our MOSFET, it's not going to be 0.07 ohms. It's going to be a lot higher. And maybe I'm guessing that maybe with 2.2 volts going into the gate of our MOSFET, maybe the resistance of this is looking something like about 10 ohms. So in theory, if we set this potentiometer now to 10 ohms, as we saw before, this motor should be running at about 2.5 amps. It should be running about half its speed. So let me, uh, let me grab my little handle and I'm just going to adjust this until we're at about 10 ohms. Well, I can see our motor's turning, but something seems to be going wrong. We seem to have, uh, oh dear, we seem to have some uh, smokage going on. So in the last example there, we saw what happens when we actually have the MOSFET switched off, when we have it in its high resistance zone. We also saw what happens when we switched it fully on and its resistance was very low and that the motor was then running at its top speed. But as you saw, when we didn't switch the MOSFET fully on, when we only switched it on about part way so that it had 10 ohms across it, well, things went horribly wrong, didn't they? Well, of course, we all know that in operation, switches where you switch things on and off, they generally don't get hot, do they? But of course, we've all got experience of resistors and resistors in circuits do get hot. So if we do attempt to use our MOSFET as a resistor, it will actually dissipate power across it and that power will come out as heat. And we can get a rough idea of exactly how much power is being dissipated using a simple formula. So if we take our voltage and square it and divide it by the resistance, that will actually give us the wattage. So in our case, our supply voltage is 24 times it by 24 and then divide by 9.6 ohms and that equals 60 watts. Well, there was absolutely no way that our little potentiometer there could actually dissipate 60 watts. So what actually happened is it got very hot and it burnt out. Now exactly the same thing would actually happen to our MOSFET transistor. So when it comes to actually switching motors on and off, you have to use them in what they call saturation mode. And that means that you switch the MOSFET fully on. If you try to use it in its resistive mode, you'll see what happens. It will get very hot and it will burn out. Now, having just spent the last 20 minutes flapping my mouth off about MOSFETs, there's just one more characteristic that I'd like to talk about before we go. Now I said that at the start of the video that our MOSFETs are voltage operated devices and actually no current goes into the gate. 
Now that statement is actually true in that at DC the gate of a MOSFET has got a very very high resistance. It's effectively almost an infinite resistance. It's right up there in the gig ohms. But one thing that a MOSFET gate does have is it has an awful lot of capacitance and it can be in the thousands of picofarads. Now this gate capacitance can actually cause us quite a lot of problems. Now of course everybody knows that you know the point of capacitors is that they charge up and they discharge and of course charging and discharging takes time. So previously out of our microcontroller here we had this nice kind of square wave. It had very very fast almost infinitely quick rise and fall times but if we actually feed the gate of our MOSFET here and we imagine we've got this large capacitor strapped across the gate that's going to have an effect on this rise and fall time. Now before we had the capacitor in circuit, the voltmeter that we've got here, you would have seen that the needle on it would have been going up and down really quickly. But now we've got a capacitor in circuit, it's actually going to have to charge up and then it's going to have to discharge. So the needle is going to be going up and down much more slowly. And of course it's the job of MOSFET man, he's got to look at the voltmeter reading and he's got to control this potentiometer. He's got to move it accordingly. So before he was moving it up and down very very quickly, now he's going to be moving it up and down much more slowly. But the problem we've got now is because it's moving much more slowly, it's actually staying in this resistive zone. It's not spending its time f turned fully on and turned fully off. It's, it's spending its time between those conditions. It's partly on. So it's in this resistive area. Now, as we just saw earlier, being in this resistive area, that means that the MOSFET is going to dissipate current. It's going to get hot. Now, of course, what we actually need is we actually need to make sure that the little handle is being cranked as quickly as possible. We need to make sure that the MOSFET spends as little time in the resistive zone and it spends most of its time either off or in the fully saturated region. So when we design our circuit to control this MOSFET, what we've actually got to do is we've got to make sure we can make this voltage across this capacitor. We need to make it rise and fall as quickly as possible. So we actually need to drive quite a lot of current into it. So we're not really driving the current into the MOSFET as such. We're kind of driving it into the gate capacitance. And actually, to actually make this waveform rise and fall quite quickly, you actually have to drive in quite a lot of current. So when we take a look at the circuit that I've designed, we'll see how we're going to do that. Well, the original MOSFET used in my spindle driver was an IRL 540N. And from the top of my head, that's a 35 amp MOSFET. But I decided to use an upgraded MOSFET in our new enhanced spindle driver. And the main reason I did that is because it's what I had in stock. But looking at the data sheet for my stock MOSFET, I think you'll agree that it's a good choice. So the MOSFET that I'm going to use has a drain current of 50 amps and it actually has a maximum pulse current of nearer to 200 amps. So of course this is more than adequate to use for our spindle drive motor which is rated at around 5 amps. Although a motor will tend to draw much more current when it's starting off. Now the other thing that makes it a good choice is the fact that it's got this 200 volt VDSS. So that means that it can stand a maximum voltage between the drain and its source of 200 volts. So that's nearly 100 volts better than the previous MOSFET and that should help us deal with any nasty back EMF problems from our spindle motor. Now I also wanted to draw your attention to this maximum gate to source voltage. Well for this MOSFET it's actually listed as being 20 volts. Well our supply on my MOSFET driver board is actually 24 volts. So we've got to consider that in our circuit design. So this is our spindle motor control circuit and as you can see it really is very simple. So our power MOSFET is here and as we mentioned earlier it's a low side driver. So one side of the MOSFET is connected to the ground, the other side is connected to the motor and the other side of the motor is connected to our 24 volt supply. So when we actually want to turn the motor on what we do is we pull down one side to ground and a current will flow through the 24 volts into our motor then back down into our MOSFET and down to ground. 
Now I'm sure that most of you are familiar with fitting a flyback protection diode whenever you're using something like a relay contact or a solenoid or in this case a big motor but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that I'm using a UF, a UF 4003 so that's an ultra fast shock diode. Now if you're just switching a motor on or off and leaving it on or off it doesn't really matter about the type of diode, you would just generally use a rectifier diode, something like that. But because we're switching this motor on and off so quickly, because it's being pulse width modulated, it's very important you use an ultra fast diode. Because if you don't, the uh, this diode will actually stay conducting at the wrong time and it will it will cause you problems. So again, if you're pulse width modulation, you, you, you need to use a fast diode. So we've got a resistor here with a fairly low value of 100 ohms and this is to prevent some parasitic oscillation within the MOSFET but the other reason you can tune this 100 ohms to actually kind of well, it helps you control the rise and fall time because sometimes you don't want the rise and fall time to be too fast because that can generate EMC. So depending on what value you choose of resistor, you can actually quite finely tune the, um, the switching on characteristics of the MOSFET. But 100 ohms is a very typical value. But the most important thing about our MOSFET driver is I did say we have to try to switch it on and off relatively quickly and that's why I've chosen to use a proprietary MOSFET driver. Now the main reason that I actually chose to use this proprietary MOSFET driver which is a HCPL J314 well there's a couple of reasons one I had some in stock but two is because it's a nice way of delivering that drive current to the gate of our MOSFET to enable it to switch very quickly and another nice feature of this driver chip is the fact that it's opto isolated now it is always a nice feature to have some isolation between your control voltage and your power switching voltage it can actually cause all kinds of havoc if you get switching noise imposed on things like the digital inputs and outputs of the microcontroller so having some separation in the form of opto isolation can really make your day go much better but the main feature of actually choosing to use this driver chip is these two transistors here and of course you can actually do this using a discrete circuit if you choose to it's not really very complicated but you can see we've got two transistors here now the top transistor when we switch it on it will actually put power into the gate of our MOSFET and switch it on but when we actually want to turn the MOSFET off it's very important to discharge that capacitor within the gate so you can see we've got a second transistor which is going to pull the gate back to ground again so it's a lot like some of the amplifiers you'll see and it's a pushing and pulling arrangement and the whole point of this is to is to get our current into the gate of our MOSFET and to have a very fast rise and fall time now when we want to switch our MOSFET on, it's this transistor that will start conducting and you can see it will effectively connect the gate of the MOSFET to VCC. Now in this case our VCC is 24 volts, but we said earlier that the maximum voltage which my MOSFET gate will withstand is only 20 volts, so we've got to do a little bit just to calm that down. So you can see that I've built this little 16 volt regulator circuit and I'm using two 8 volt Zener diodes again because I had two 8 volt ones in stock. Probably even 16 volts is a little on the high side, 12 volts would have been sufficient. So we're generating our 16 volt supply, we've got some decoupling uh, in the form of a 22 microfarad large storage capacitor and then a 100 nanofarad. So we're actually feeding that 16 volts in place of VCC. So the maximum voltage that our MOSFET gate will see is only 16 volts. And given that the maximum voltage is 20, that should work a bit better. Now on this side of the circuit here, this is where we're going to take in the pulse width modulation, which is quite high level. This is at 24 volts, and this was originally feeding the spindle motor. So in order to light the little diode that's inside here, we need to drop that. So I'm just using a, a 1.5K resistor. And you can actually see in the return part of the circuit, we're actually putting that through another LED. So the idea is here, um, this LED will get brighter as the pulse width modulation, as the on time increases, this LED will get brighter. So it gives us a little bit of indication that we're getting some incoming pulse width modulation and kind of whether that is mainly on or mainly off. So when the motor is going to be mainly fully on, this will be lit brightly, but when it's only running slowly, this should be quite dim. 
Now the main supply is actually going to be generated by that large 24 volt 15 amp switch mode power supply. So that's going to get fed into our spindle control board here on this connector J1. And you can actually see that I've got some of the connections connected together. So the ground side I've got 1 and 2 connected. And then the 24 volt side I've got 3 and 4 connected. So that allows me to bring the 24 volts onto our spindle motor control board and actually also output it then to actually the gerbil control board where it's providing 24 volts to the stepper motor. So that's just a convenient way of looping in and out. We've got some decoupling in the form of a 1000 microfarad capacitor. Uh, a bit more decoupling would have been nice actually but I was limited to how much I could fit in the enclosure. 100 nanofarad and of course we've got to have another LED here which is just being used as a power indicator LED. So as you can see our circuit really is a very simple one with most of the heavy lifting being done by our optical isolated MOSFET driver and I actually think this is quite a good choice for this type of application and I think something that I will use again. Well I'm sure some of you might be wondering what happened to our friend the transistor man. Well I'm afraid after being made famous by Howitson Hill in the book Art of Electronics it really didn't end well for him. And I'm afraid that all the fame and the money eventually led to a drink and drugs problem. And just a few short years later he was actually found dead in a pool of his own vomit with a cheap prostitute called Cindy. Okay, that should be done. It's been cooking about three minutes. Yep, that looks pretty good to me. All the uh, copper's now been eaten away. Now, it is a little bit hit and miss, this toner transfer method. The etching always goes perfectly. The problem is getting your laser printer to actually transfer enough ink actually through the transfer medium onto the PCB. If you actually manage to get the ink onto the PCB this method works flawlessly. Okay so I think I'm pretty happy with that so now it's just the tedious drilling part next. Okay, well we've gone ahead and we've drilled all our holes there as you can see, so uh, let's take it inside and build the thing. Well as you can see I've taken the circuit board that we've just made and uh, I've just clamped it down into my little assembly jig. I am quite a fan of these, it does make assembling things quite a bit easier. And uh, one of the good things about it is normally you end up holding and touching the circuit board a lot and getting uh, jammy fingers and grease all over the tracks. That makes them dirty and harder to solder to. So once you've cleaned the board as I have done here, it's a good idea just to put it straight into the jig and uh, avoid touching it as much as possible. So I think I'll just go ahead and I'm going to assemble this in uh, no particular order. Now, of course, one slight problem with building your own circuit boards like this is you don't have uh, any solder resist. But um, again, such a simple circuit, it doesn't really matter. One thing that I did do to make it a bit easier to assemble this, after the problems I had last time drilling through the pads, I actually went over and I've enlarged all the pads. And in fact, quite a lot of the tracks are uh, wider than they actually need to be for this actual circuit. And uh, that was done really, not so much to do with the electrical characteristics, but mainly just to help with the uh, process of making the PCB. So the, uh, the ground plane that I've got on here, it's got quite a big spacing around the tracks and things like that and again all that is just to make it easier to uh, to etch it and manufacture it. So what I'm saying is I've really just opened up the uh, the tolerances on everything and uh, all the pads I've actually made bigger. Okay there's my connector blocks in. So the next components that I'm sticking in is our little Zener regulator. Now we need the regulator on this circuit because the gate voltage for this uh, 
MOSFET that we're going to be driving it's actually specified as having a maximum gate voltage of 20 volts well of course we actually have a 24 volt supply here so it was just necessary to pull that um, 24 volts down to something a bit more sensible so I'm using two 8 volt Zener diodes here so we're going to be pulling pulling the 24 down to about 16 volts so the next component that I'm putting in is R1. Now R1 is actually used as the uh, the series resistor for this little Zener regulator. Oh, it looks like I forgot to solder the diodes in, so I'll do that now. I think we might as well stick our MOSFET driver in next. Now I've actually decided not to put it in a holder because there's not a lot of clearance above this little IC. There's actually a fuse holder sits above it. So the fact that I've decided not to put it in a socket means that it'll probably expire almost immediately. So this next resistor is R3. So this is actually the drive resistor or current limiting resistor for the Opto isolator for the actual LED part of the Opto. And uh, that's 1.5k because I'm driving it relatively hard. Next resistor is R5 which is 100 ohms and that's the drive resistor for our MOSFET gate. Oop, got the band on the wrong side, can't have that can we? I think I'd quite like to get one of them little uh, jigs that for bending component legs to the right whip so that they go in nice. I know you can 3D print them, I think I'm going to have to do that because uh, it would make installing some of these resistors a little bit neater. Now I'm having to trim a lot of the legs on these components really quite short and the reason that I'm doing that is because there's not going to be uh, a lot of clearance between the bottom of this circuit board and the, uh, the aluminium um, back plate. And uh, we don't want things shorting out. So the next components that I'm installing are these two capacitors which are the smoothing for our little Zener regulator. Now the design values for these were 100 nanofarads and 22 microfarads but rather than putting a 22 microfarads in I've actually just stuck 100 in and uh, the reason I put 100 in is because there was one on the bench in front of me and I didn't have to get out of my chair so uh, that's why it's getting 100. Again very non-critical values here. Of course the most important thing in is just to make sure we put them in the right way around. Well it is for the electrolytic anyway. So of course my little circuit needs as many LEDs on it as possible because LEDs are a good thing. So uh, I'm just putting in a little 2K2 resistor which is just the uh, current limit resistor for our little power on lamp. And here's a power LED we were talking about, so let's um, just make sure we get this in the wrong way around. Almost certainly will. So when it comes to LEDs, solder one leg down first, and then turn the board over, make sure it's pointing in roughly the right direction, and then solder in the second leg. Because if you don't do that, it's always annoying when you put them in and then you find out they're slightly staggered or cocked to one side. I speak from experience, having done that many times. And seeing as we've probably put one LED the wrong way around, well, let's do the same with the other one. And then they can both be wrong together. I think we're pretty much now on the uh, penultimate component, so this connector is going to be the output, this goes to our spindle motor. Let's just see if I can jam this in with a bit of blue tack because it's a little bit loose. I had to hope, open the holes out a little bit to get this connector in because the, uh, the drill I used was a bit small and I've opened it up just a little bit too far. So it's a bit wibbly wobbly now but it'll be okay when it's in. And I can see that I've actually put that in the wrong way around. Okay, that should be better. So 
So the next but last component is this flyback diode and this is a UF403 and uh, this is a, a fast diode, it's a fast Schottky diode and uh, we need a fast diode rather than a standard rectifier diode because this actual motor drive is driving it using uh, pulse width modulation at quite a fast speed and uh, especially with quite a sharp rise and fall time now we're using this driver you'll find that if you just use um, a standard rectifier diode for the flyback you'll find that it won't work properly because of the recovery time the, the reverse recovery time on the diode so when you do using motors that have pulse with modulation drives make sure you use a fast shock your diode and uh, I've also just found that the legs on this diode are just a little bit too big for my holes I think I drilled all these holes about 0.8 millimeters. These look as though they could be closer to one, so I'm going to have to open them up a bit, I'm afraid. Ah, get in. I had a sudden onset of total cack handedness, then, I'm afraid. Oh, it looks like I'm having a repeat attack. Okay, that's our board done. So the other thing we've got to do now is uh, actually take it out of the jig and we've got to assemble it onto the back plate and uh, try to just judge where our MOSFET goes because the MOSFET of course that needs bolting down to the heat sink. Now I'm sure that some of you are wondering why I'm actually choosing to make this little enclosure for our pulse width modulator which is really quite a simple thing. Why am I making it this very complicated way involving stuff like machining and you know that kind of malarkey? Well the simple answer is, is because I enjoy doing it this way. I'm sure that there's more straightforward ways of doing it, quicker and simpler ways but you know I've got a milling machine here, I felt like using it, why not? Now the other thing that I wanted to try today, I've never actually tried gluing anything to the bed of my milling machine before but I have seen that a lot of the more professional people do actually do this so rather than having a complicated flip fixture to actually hold this or put it in a vice what I'm actually going to do is I've just put some masking tape on, a, on this piece of scrap wood and another piece of masking tape on the back of here and I'm going to actually use super glue to actually, um, well, to actually glue the two things together so I've never actually um, done this before so I'm doing it for the first time so I'm going to put a coat in a super glue on here should I have read the instructions? perhaps I should yeah maybe that would have been a good idea yeah maybe I'll read them now put super glue on one side of this piece of metal which I have done I've got a spray activator on the other and put them together I think I'll just um, so there's we've got the super glue on, here's the activator. God that stuff smells. And now in theory all I have to do is drop this on here and uh, it should stick. Well that's all of the machining done and I'm glad to say that was really straightforward. I'm really happy with the idea of uh, gluing the workpiece down onto the spoil board. That's the first time I've ever tried that. But I guess the question is, can I get it off the board? That's going to be the hard part. So in theory we should just be able to pull this uh, masking tape off. I can still feel that's a bit sticky so I don't know if all that uh, cyanoacrylic adhesive did stick but yeah okay let's keep pulling away well I think that worked really well well of course it's not essential in a non-production environment but when it comes to uh, fondling MOSFETs I actually think that the best tool is a strap-on so uh, 
yep here's my strap on so we'll put that on well unfortunately I think my uh, MOSFET wiring I think it's going to have to kind of uh, bend up and then come back down again in some well not an ideal fashion maybe I should have thought about this layout a little bit more carefully so I've just bent these uh, legs over but I've tried to put kind of you know quite soft bends in them because uh, I want them to almost act as springs <laughs> looks like some, this MOSFET is starting to take on the appearance of some kind of like some kind of crippled insect like a you know it looks like a spider that's been partially amputated okay I think you, tr you can probably see what I'm trying to achieve here can't you I think what we might do is just solder it up a little bit and then double check it. Maybe just solder this one leg on first. Okay, I think we will get that to work. It's not ideal, but it's a bit messy. I wish I'd uh, done it a little bit neater than that, but uh, yeah, that's what we've got. I think it'll be okay. Okay, I think that'll probably do. So I think what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll throw caution to the wind and uh, just go ahead and we'll put some heatsink compound on here. And I think we need an insulating washer. I'm fairly sure that the uh, the back tab on here is uh, is non-isolated. In fact, let's just check that. I'm pretty sure it isn't isolated. Just got the Beepermatic 2000 out. Yeah. Okay, more than enough there. In fact, there's so much on there, we will turn that over and squidge it on the other way. Well, that's designed to go something like that. So I went ahead and I also 3D printed some little spacers which just lift the board up. So I've got to go ahead and find them and see if we can put them in and uh, find four screws. And I think we're about done. We should be able to give it a test then, shouldn't we? Well, there you go. Maybe not exactly like a bought one, but um, yeah, not too bad, is it? But I wonder if this 3D cover that I printed, I wonder if this will actually uh, fit it. It's designed to, so uh, will that go over there? Oh, it's very close to hitting the top of that capacitor. I've got absolute millimetres to spare. Well, perhaps one millimetre. OK, it looks to go together. So you can probably see at the moment I've got this device, it's actually a 3 amp thermal fuses and uh, I think I've actually got some higher current rated ones, this has got a little 3 on it so it's a 3 amp. I think somewhere I've got some 5s and 7s so I need to swap this out for maybe a 5 or a 7 amp one, um, but that's a job for later on. OK, well we've just finished assembling our little printed circuit board and uh, fixing our MOSFET down to this kind of fairly thick aluminium plate which is going to be a heat sink. I actually don't think it's going to be getting terribly hot but um, yeah, I'm sure it'll stay completely cold actually but yeah, it's got a heat sink hasn't it. So let's uh, get this mounted. I'm going to put this on something like that. I did think about uh, testing it first but then again I decided well let's live dangerously. Probably work. Yeah, maybe not. Okay, that's going to go something like that. Now I may have said earlier that I was going to try to change this fuse here, this thermal fuse for a bigger one. Well I had a look through the uh, drawer and unfortunately this 3 amp one is the only one I've got. So I've uh, only put this in loosely because I think at some point maybe I've got some more of these at work that share a higher current. But hopefully it will be good enough to uh, do a little bit of testing but I guess we'll find out. Not exactly necessary because it is all 24 volts but we did go ahead and add an earth so uh, I'm just going to put that on now. Now of course it isn't actually good practice to use a, a mounting screw like this for uh, an earth but uh, 
should have drilled a separate hole somewhere but uh, yeah I didn't. So this two core cable that I'm just trying to get into the connector this is the power which actually runs the uh, what they call the Gerbil control board and it also provides the power to the um, the access to the servo motors. Now previously this supply was coming from a little separate switch mode power supply, a little power brick but we're going to do away with that power brick and uh, feed it from the you know the big switch mode we've got. Okay so that's the outgoing power, we've got to put the incoming power in now so uh, that's going to come in on that one and that one. These uh, connectors I'm using they're a bit cheap and nasty, they do feel definitely a little bit kind of uh, janky, I'm hoping that the uh, Hoping the things don't just come apart because they may do. Okay, now this connector that I've just got to put on here, this is going to be output power to our spindle motor. I do feel as though they're just going to kind of snap them, <laughs> give them that extra turn, turn, and they just go snap, ping, and fly apart. Okay, well we got away with that one. I think what we'll do is we might try a little intermediate power test at that. Oh, and we have been rewarded with a little green LED. Okay, well our LED looks like we're putting about five times the amount of current through it. It actually needs to illuminate it, but uh, yeah, she'll be right. Well I actually had to cut the power lead off the old power brick because uh, I couldn't find one that had quite the uh, centre pin diameter. Now in theory this thing is centre pin positive so let's give that a try. Oops, there we go, 24 volts. So this connector on the end here, this is the one that actually feeds our spindle motor originally and it's being fed from this MOSFET here which is on the Gerbil control board. but. What we need to do is we've got to uh, divert this wire. This was going to the spindle motor. We've got to actually now divide this up and we've got to connect it to the pulse with modulation input of our little driver circuit. And then we've actually got to reconnect our motor to uh, this output connector, which is here. Now, unfortunately, um, I haven't got any of these headers. I don't know, is that a GST header or a Molex? Maybe it's a Molex. I'm not quite sure. I haven't got one that quite fits this pattern. So I'm afraid we're going to have to do some snippy snip snip and uh, just join some wires onto here. So I think I'll, what I'll do is I'm just going to cut them there. And then this wire here is going to reconnect onto uh, this connector on the side of here which is our spindle motor output drive. Now the reason I put a connector on here for the, uh, for the spindle motor is because I thought I might want to change the spindle motor to something else in the future or maybe plug a laser into it or some other tool. So I thought what I would do is I would put that onto a connector rather than hard wiring it and that gives me you know just a little bit of choice of what I want to do. Well, it's starting to feel like it's coming together now. So this connection is going to feed in the uh, the pulse width modulation output from our Gerbil control port into our MOSFET high power driver. So let's just get that wire threaded through a grommet. And of course this pulse width modulation drive from the old spindle motor, it's actually going into an opto-isolated channel. Now strictly speaking we probably didn't need it but I always think that when you're working on things like CNC's, especially bigger CNC's and bigger things with motor controls on, opto isolation is definitely the way to go because uh, stray currents and voltages can be a real pain to diagnose. You can get all kinds of strange problems with CNC machines running erratically. So hopefully we've done the right thing by uh, opto isolating it. Oh, this feels so cheap and nasty these connectors. They do feel cheap and nasty and they probably are but uh, I've used these on a few little projects and again I always say these is I use them because they are the cheapest things I could buy on Amazon but they actually seem quite good. They feel as though they're about to snap in half and break but I've got to admit I haven't broke one yet so they're not too bad. 
Right, we're um, we're about done really. Um, hmm, moment of truth. We've just got to uh, put some power on it, connect up the computer, and see if it does anything. 